Speaks Student. Reality TV Part One: Introduction to Reality TV. Uh, so we're talking about reality television in this course, and we have with us Deb Tennant, who actually runs our creative department here at Shmup. Uh, and she is a PhD in literature, a published author in People Magazine, and also is a regular subscriber to, where are you a subscriber to? Entertainment Weekly. Entertainment Weekly. That probably qualifies her best to discourse on, uh, on this topic. The challenge is that reality television has taken over our lives in a lot of ways. It accounts for about a third of the television programming on today, and it's growing very fast. So we're going to talk about reality television from a few different perspectives uh, and have Deb sort of enlighten us from the way that she sees things from reality television as literature. What are the origins of reality television? Reality TV can be dated as far back as Candid Camera. Candid Camera with Alan Fun. Starring you, the people. Welcome to the Candid Camera program, which brings you secretly made movies of all kinds of people in all kinds of situations. Which was in 1948, which most people know because there's been a lot of reboots of it. Hidden cameras, watching people do silly things. Uh, and that's considered reality TV because it's non-celebrities being put in unscripted situations. But reality TV as we think of it today really started more with uh, the real world uh, in the 90s. You know, put people in a house and see what happens, have them do stupid stuff, and... Uh, hear what they have to say about it. And the irony that it was called the real world. When reality TV started, it actually was pretty real. Even the first few seasons of Survivor, which started in uh, 2000, were pretty much unscripted. Today, you'd be hard pressed to find any reality show that is not in some way at least constructed. Does reality TV have a script? While there's not a, a script in the way that you would think of a script for a sitcom, they do have producers uh, and writers feeding them at least conversation topics, if, if not actual lines to say. They put them in specific situations uh, and they give them conversation topics knowing exactly where that's going to lead. So then what's the casting process like? It seems like all these people are lunatics. Or, you know, trying to become stars, I guess? Does that ever work? Absolutely. Um, it does work. People become stars from uh, reality TV all the time. Uh, Elizabeth Hasselbeck, I think her name is, who hosted The View, started as a contestant on Survivor. There are tons of people on kind of these food cooking shows that become celebrity chefs because of it. The casting process has changed a lot since the beginning of reality TV, since like the early, say, Survivor real world days. It used to be that you would do a video interview and show how kooky and weird you were, and then they'd say, oh, this is an interesting personality, let's get them in the house. Now, uh, most casting is actually producers going out and finding failed actors and actresses in Southern California and saying, you're hot, you're hot, you can, you know, string a sentence together, uh, let's put you, like you said, on an island and see what happens. I think the most recent uh, season of Survivor only had one uh, auditioned person cast on the mm. show. Everyone else was recruited from, uh, from producers kind of just going around finding them. So if you're a producer, what you're, you're looking for someone with an emotionally volatile personality, maybe someone who's kind of an alcoholic, like what, what, what are you yeah. trying to look Well, there are definitely archetypes, right, mm -hmm. um, that, that you want to hit. So yes, you want the person who's emotionally volatile because that's going to make everyone else freak out and what you're looking for is the most drama possible. You also want someone who's really dumb because part of the, uh, Part of the excitement of watching reality TV is feeling superior to everyone who's on there, so if you feel more competent than them, that's good. You want uh, someone who's incredibly smart, someone who's incredibly hot, but that every single person watching can relate to one type of person and hate a one type of person. So you bring up two interesting perspectives here. One is that of the contestant, what kind of low self-esteem they must have to want to actually be on one of these shows. Uh, and the other is the audience needing to feel superior to someone who's kind of loserly to start with. Right, yeah, These the contestants, the ones that we're talking about that get recruited are people who just want exposure. Um, these are the people who, you watch The Bachelor, these are the people who go on even though they're in a relationship or whatever, they just want to get their music career going and they just want to, you know, cause as much drama as possible so that people remember their name and their face. From the other side of it, you know. From the audience yeah, perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's the same reason that you like sit at the counter at Starbucks and watch people go by and think about how ugly her purse looks and like you know how that person can lose a few pounds and all that. It's kind of that that same thing of you know the way we all do. We judge people because it makes us feel better about ourselves. And some people voice it and some people don't. So that that makes a lot of sense. Has society become more compressive 
uh, so that needing to feel superior has become a, a bigger deal to us as a, as a mass? I think as we grow as a, a society that needs is more materialistic and more superficial, of course, we're going to want to think that we're more beautiful and more intelligent than everyone else around us.